So my name is Leonard Paul. Sometimes I go by Leonard J. Paul for uh, Google ability. And uh, yeah, I've been working off and on in games since uh, 1994 and uh, started teaching video games in 2001. I've uh, worked on a good number of titles at Electronic Arts, Radical Entertainment, and uh, done some indie games as well. And these days I focus on uh, doing uh, education. So I still work in games, but I sort of uh, teach people how to do video game audio online. So that's my focus. I started out actually wanting to do graphics programming, so I started out at uh, Simon Fraser University uh, in 91 doing just general programming and then in 94 that's when I got a basically a op an offer from uh, Electronic Arts to do a co-op, so that's like an intern and it was paid which was really cool so I actually made money at it. Uh, it was supposed to be for eight months, they did four months, then they did another four months so I got hired back again. But uh, as far as an audio programmer, really what, uh, there's, there's different things that you can do. So there's, the way that I view it is that there's kind of three different levels. So what I did um, when I started out is that I was an audio tools programmer. So what that person does is that they basically make the job easier for the composer or the sound designer to put their sounds into the game. So they basically make software that's custom built for whatever systems that particular game company is using for their games and it allows them uh, to just be faster about it and to be able to review their work quicker and to be able to basically not waste a lot of time with the technology. So we have tools now like Audio Middleware like Wise or FMOD Studio and those weren't around in those days. Like there was more sort of the lower level stuff uh, that were audio libraries. But that just allowed the audio, sort of the audio coder that was working on the actual game to put their code in easier without having to specifically write code for the actual hardware. So you know, when I started out, I was an audio tools coder. Uh, when I was working on uh, uh, Need for Speed. I was doing. Uh, <clears throat> I was a uh, library uh, coder, so I was doing the basically like the drivers to make things run on the PlayStation 2, and so that's the low-level code that sits between uh, the game audio code and then the hardware. So what it does is it basically abstracts out. You know, it makes it so that it's you don't have to redo the code for different video games. You just have your game audio code and it says play sound and you don't have to worry about if it's playing on like a Sega Genesis or a SNES. It just knows to do the right calls and it does it. But on the tool side, that's where you have to change the code. So it's the same thing as like graphics drivers. You know, you got your NVIDIA or you know, whatever Intel. And so there's graphics drivers that tell the chips what to do but the actual driver has to make sure that it works you know, with the actual hardware. Um, so there is at that lower level, that's where the audio tools uh, kind of thing feeds into the driver. And then in the middle part, you've got the game audio coder. And what they do is that they basically get events from the game that are like, say, footsteps or gunshots or, I don't know, uh, you know, music calls or something like that. And then what they do is uh, take those events from the game and then they code up stuff specific for that game, and then it talks to the, uh, the low-level audio code. So, so there's a couple different areas that you could be a, a game audio coder. And I'm sure there's more that you could sort of split it into, like if you're doing, you could also do like another level above that, would, which would be like audio scripting that you could do with an, um, say like uh, Python or Lua or something like that. And so say if you're doing game audio implementation that that might be part of your role as a technical sound artist is to actually do scripting, which actually is sort of light level coding. And so that would sit sort of at a similar level as that middle game audio code layer. So yeah, there's, there's sort of different ways you can kind of stratify it. So I've sort of done all of those different uh, levels. But it, definitely the, the most difficult part is doing the, the low level audio driver stuff where you're you know when I was working on the PlayStation 2 we we're coding an assembly so that was for the IOP the input output processor and uh, <clears throat> that's actually the same chip that they used for that uh, space probe that went out and took pictures of Pluto it's the same chip that was used for that so yeah there are some pretty interesting programming back in those systems so yeah that's uh, 
general idea of like audio coding. Yeah, there's actually a lot of possibilities for being creative and coding, but the thing is that it's just, it comes down to politics a lot of the times. So say uh, at Electronic Arts, I had a lot of leeway when they were like, oh yeah, the guy's doing a great job. So when I was working on Need for Speed at the beginning, uh, what I did is that um, you want to basically make things run as fast as you can. So say like you don't want the audio causing a process to happen where it, you know, blocks the graphics so that like you're, you know, you're playing a racing game and then it stutters for a few frames and you're like, well, what happened there? Oh, we were loading something off of the disc and when it loads off the disc it actually has to look on the DVD and find it and then it comes back like those kind of mechanical processes are really slow so what you do is you basically say like look for that and then oh come back to me when you found it so that's sort of an interrupt way of programming rather than a polling way of, of programming where you're like oh are you there yet are you there yet are you there yet no okay and then that would block the game right whereas the game could be doing all the stuff at that time but it's it's trickier to do the interrupt method where you're you've got one thing that's sort of like okay let me know when you're ready and then the game doing its own thing because then when the interrupt comes back you know you have to wait for the game to be in a good spot to say like oh hey <laughs> i've got this thing that needs to get done right so when working on uh, Hot Pursuit, one of the things that I did is that I brought down, we had some of these things that are called peaks, and I brought some of the larger peaks down to a tenth of their size. So what I did is that I took those things that needed to be processed, and then I sort of chopped them down into smaller chunks, and then distributed those so that it wouldn't impact the frame rate as much. So that was kind of creative. I was allowed to do what I wanted to there. Um, and. On other games, it really depends. Like sometimes you can have, so you can just be micromanaged as well. So sometimes there'll be people that are like, no, we specifically want you to do it this way. When I was working at uh, Radical Entertainment, <clears throat> um, I actually had this guy, uh, Martin Sykes, that was working there. And he uh, would, he would actually look at the code that everybody was checking in because he was the technical lead and so he would actually basically sort of like it's almost like reaching into your back pocket and kind of going like oh no we're not putting that in the game oh no that might be a problem so there's all these things that you know you can do creatively that might cause something technically kind of bad to maybe happen and so he was very tight about that programming stuff so sometimes you can run into issues there where you're like yeah but there's a possibility that this could do something really cool and they're like, well, it might cause the game to crash. It's like, well, yeah, sure, anything can, but you know, like, really, do you want it to be kind of cool, or do you want to really do that sort of straight and narrow? So, yeah, it really depends at uh, which company you're working at, and really what their uh, company kind of like culture is like. One thing is that when I was first working at EA, so you know, talk about an older story. So that was like, yeah, '94. You know, I I started out doing quality assurance. So I was actually uh, trying to figure out bugs in the game and stuff like that. So I wasn't related to audio. Then when I got hired back, that's where I was actually programming. I started out doing graphics, and then I did this little Easter egg for NBA Live 95 for the last little chunk of it once they sort of trusted that I knew what I was doing. And so basically, if you lose the finals, you go golfing. So what I did for the Easter egg is that I brought in a whole bunch of assets from other games. So basically like the golfing game. And I think I brought in like some graphics from another game as well and put those together, including the sound as well. And so this was on the Sega Genesis. And so at EA, they had this super top secret, like, you know, audio engine possibility where the Sega Genesis really only allowed you to play back like one sampled sound at a time. But at EA, they had not only you know, that you could play back two sounds, but they also had this top secret like 10 to 1 audio compression that they used for speech. So there was all these uh, different things that, you know, that basically that you couldn't talk about that were really cool things that you could use in, you know, the game that you program. So anyways, when I was programming this Easter egg, I talked to uh, Kevin Pickell, who was the, the lead programmer that had done the, uh, the programming for uh, getting two sounds to play at the same time, and I asked him how he did it, and he wouldn't tell me. <laughs> so it's like, okay, great, thanks. I work at this company, but it's like so top secret that they don't even want to let you know how they do certain things. And so really like what they did is software mixing is that they would take the two sampled sounds and then they would down mix them into one. But the tricky part is to do that while the game is running at the same time. 
So if you remember from games from the Commodore 64 time, sometimes the games would actually stop playing if there was sampled sound, simply because there was so much processing of just getting the samples out there that it would be difficult to play any sound at this, or sorry, to play any graphics at the same time. So yeah, that's that was interesting. So they were like, yeah, no, we're not going to tell you. But the, he was very smug about that he was able to do this, you know, particular, you know, coding feat. When working with game audio, sort of the typical way that we work with sound these days is that we sample sound. So what we do is we take a, a real sound event and then we record it into a microphone uh, and then we store that digitally somehow. So really the way that that works is that it's sort of uh, putting the sound to like a grid. It's quantifying it both sort of through time and then also through sort of um, sound pressure level, like through sort of volume. And so you do that and then you can store it in a digital medium, then you play it back. Uh, the problem with that is that with uh, video games is that you don't know what's going to happen next. So say if you've got like a car chase and the car is squealing around the corner, well, what are you going to do? Are you going to really record like, you know, I don't know, the, 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 even a hundred different possibilities for that tire squeal. It's like, oh, and then it like, you know, it goes off the edge of the pavement and then it hits the gravel. How are we going to transition between those? Well, that's what you have to do in games all the time. So with granulation, what it allows you to do is you have that original sample, but then you cut it up into little bits. And what you can do is that you basically explode that into a bunch of grains and you can individually control all those grains, like the pitch values, in other words, how, you know, how high or how low that sounds, how loud it is. And then also you can change the texture of the sound. If you play a lot of grains at once, it produces sort of a different audio texture. If you sort of, instead of just playing a few grains at the same time. So it really gives a, um, a way of making the sample malleable. So that instead of just having like this two dimensional picture that you're trying to stick onto this event that might or might not go the way that you want it to, it's like slicing the picture up into little bits where you can bend it to the curves of the way that the interactivity is actually going. So yeah, I spoke like uh, twice at the Game Developer Conference about granulation. And when I went to Simon Fraser University, I learned from one of the guys that kind of, not so much necessarily invented it, but sort of popularized it. His name's Barry Truax and so, that was where I kind of went like, man, there's this thing called granulation that would be awesome for video games because instead of, you know, trying to get this one sample or like multiple samples where we're sort of, yeah, just sticking like a two dimensional kind of like picture on top of this three dimensional kind of like, you know, constantly evolving uh, interactive event this would be a great way of bending it and just making it so that it really, to me, comes alive because you're marrying the two together so that they stick together and then it just makes it really a lot more immersive for the player. I, which <laughs> brings up it's just that whole tire squeal example that when working on uh, Need for Speed, we did actually have a producer just say, exactly like oh well you know why would you be spending all this time like with you know all this technology for this car engine sound why don't you just record the car engine and it's like yeah but there's like like a limitless amount of possibilities that the car can make so yeah basically the uh, the fun part there was that we got to drive around uh, one of Don Matrix uh, Ferraris and uh, they actually dropped the transmission in it so that was a fun time. Yeah, he could afford it though. He's doing fine. <laughs> mm, well, with granulation, it's just being able to take the sampled sound and playing with it. So either you can keep things quite, um, you know, like based in reality, so you keep them sort of realistic, or you can make them totally fantastic. And like, if uh, if you've heard of this thing, there's this thing called Paul Stretch, which basically allows you to take a sample and stretch it out 20, 30, 40, 50 times. And so people on the internet have basically taken like, you know, whatever, like, uh, say like a, I don't know, a theme to a movie and then they've stretched it at like Jurassic Park or something. And the thing is, is that it's sort of, it's almost like putting a magnifying glass on the sound because when you play back the sound super slow using those grains, is that you can really focus in on how the timbres, like the textural quality of the sound, 
uh, evolves over time, whereas when you hear it in real time, it just blurs past. And that's another thing that's uh, hugely difficult about working with game audio, like on the coding side more so, is that it's a real-time system. And so most people don't understand how difficult that is as a programmer to work with the system where you can't just go like, oh, let's play this level and oh, there's a click there. Oh, like how did that happen? Oh, we'll just slow it down. Like you can do that with graphics. You can just slow the frame rate down. But when you do it with audio, you lose all the quality of the sound. Like it just, it, you know, you lower the pitch to a point where it just becomes unintelligible. So those kind of things make it very difficult to, you know, like, and, oh man, to program audio. So on one hand, you've got this real-time system that it has to be feeding the, you know, like the sound driver 48,000 samples per second for each of, say, like the seven plus one channels, right? So you've got this data flow that's happening all the time. And to maintain that and not have the game interrupt it where the game's like, oh, hey, we're doing this AI process that takes like, you know, whatever, this amount of time. And then you miss your window for when you can start stuffing the buffers for all the other channels. And then it's like, oh, hey, we heard a click in the audio. And it's like, yeah, well, <laughs> you took my processing time. Like, how am I supposed to fit that in there? So these are things that like, as a game audio coder, a, lo a lot of the times you're less like, really? Like, if you starve me, how am I, so like, or choke me? I don't know whatever the analogy is, but how am I supposed to get the job done? Like, the audio simply stops. So my favorite bug, my favorite audio bug, is like, oh yeah, game crashes audio stops, you know. Oh, no, no, wait a minute. No, the audio stopped first and then the game crashed. Well, probably what happened is that the audio buffers got starved out, you know, and then the game crashed. Sometimes the audio buffers can keep running and then the game will, you know, whatever, stop first, but anyways. Okay, procedural audio for me is when you produce audio purely from mathematics. So you're basically using like the language of symbols, uh, being mathematics, to create an audio event that usually has some sort of mapping where we can understand it in a real world sense. So looking at it in a visual way, uh, procedural audio is similar to like taking a picture of something where you've got like, it looks, you know, like what you've taken a picture of. And then it's like getting almost like a robot to do a, a tracing of it or a drawing and to try and figure out, oh, how, does, how, do, how do we approximate that so that you get the same effect from um, something that occurs in real life to something that is entirely simulated. Um, so procedural audio is really the same thing as what you're doing with graphics all the time. You know, the graphics in general are almost all procedural these days. You know, back in the day, there was so much processing to do that you would maybe like record you know, little videos and stuff like that for cutscenes. So you'd have like actors, and that sometimes happens these days. Say like things with like Mister, sort of choose your own adventure type games. They would actually have actors and then, you know, record that cutscene. And there you go, and then you go from different cutscene to cutscene. So that's kind of like having sampled sound, where you've got the sound sampled, and then you go from different things. Whereas procedural audio is really trying to figure out a way of simulating uh, audio through mathematics. Yeah. So, say something like um, granulation, I still believe is procedural because you're using uh, the sampled sound as an element, which is from the real world, but then the playback mechanism, like all the control structures, that is entirely procedural. And that's the reason why all sorts of different uh, granulations, like granulation engines, will actually sound different. Because you're, um, you're basically reconstituting the sound or are creating a new one, but the process of having like these thousands of grains occurring every second, depending on how you envelope them, how they come in and out so that they're not popping and clicking, that will totally change the way that it sounds. So say something like, um, like Wally's voice, you know, that's granulation, where Ben Burt basically sampled his voice and then using Kima, he was able to sort of bend things up, where it gets that sort of little sort of like, you know, kind of, you know, sort of choppy kind of thing. And that's where the grains are coming in and out. So depending on how many grains you have, you can make it sound very robotic like that, or you can make it sound very natural, which is what our friend 
auto-tune might be doing. I mean, they can do it in different ways, but you can do an auto-tune effect using granulation. They also use uh, phase vocoding, I think, for, uh, for auto-tune, but yeah, you can, you can do those kind of pitch, so kind of like adjustments uh, using granulation. Um, when I started out doing audio coding, uh, I really did love it for the technical challenge and also combined with the creative challenge of like, oh, hey, I want to be able to produce this, you know, aesthetic effect. Like I want to create this kind of feeling in the person listening to the audio. Um, as teams got bigger, like through the 90s, that became for me more difficult. So I had less, I became more of kind of like a bit of more of a cog and like a system. So with doing the programming stuff, it felt like we're a little bit more siloed, like we're sort of, uh, you know, separated from one another. And I felt like um, with doing content, so either doing sound design or with doing uh, composition, that I would have more control over what I was actually creating. And it, um, it's also one of those things too that I think it's, um, <sighs> poor me, but I mean like with being an audio coder, you can't really sit down with your friends and kind of go like, oh my God, like look at this thing. I did like hardware enveloping on this and I reduced the clicks and stuff and like nobody, uh, nobody, I'm not allowed to swear, am I? But I mean, what's n nobody cares. <laughs> like nobody cares. They're just like, and? It's just like, I don't even know what an analogy is. It's basically like you're producing the, not, you're not even producing the car that, like you're producing like the, like the, the, you know, the manifold or something. Like you're producing this cog that's inside of the system that nobody gets, nobody cares about. So I just found that to be tricky after a while. I basically split my uh, major between doing uh, music and sort of electronic music and doing uh, coding. And I just found that I actually made very few friends on the programming side and I, almost all the friends that I have are from the music side. And I think it's because I just, I really am, uh, when it comes down to it, I feel like I am more of an audio kind of like, you know, feeling-ish type person. So yeah, I felt that uh, doing the audio programming was cool for me, like, at a, you know, whatever, I'm so smart kind of thing. But it did become pretty isolating after a while. And uh, whereas doing composing, it was immediate where, you know, you show someone your work and they're like, wow, I feel like this. And you're like, yeah, cool. You show them <laughs> like the prints out of your code and they're like, okay, whatever, <laughs> like this is, yeah, you're one of those people. So for me, I like to straddle both, and then I also like to put a foot in, well, a third foot, I don't know how to, anyways, I like to put, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't know how, uh, like, I need, I like to sort of go between the technical, uh, the artistic, and the educational. So I like to sort of uh, straddle those <clears throat> boundaries. <laughs> Tripod. Oh, tripod. Tripod. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
Yeah, so as far as for Retro City Rampage, it's really the, like the main force behind it is Brian. So he's an amazing coder, and I met him at uh, Backbone Entertainment. I was working on a game called uh, Death Junior. Uh, no, actually, I was working on the one after that. I was working on um, uh, Sonic Rivals 2 for the PlayStation Portable. And uh, <clears throat> so Brian was a programmer there, and he just called me into his room one time. He's like, hey, I'm working on this game. You know, I'm just working on it on the side for fun. And he was totally like a homebrew kind of guy. So he actually had his own little dev kit for the NES that he made. And uh, he'd post stuff online. So that was like, I guess, uh, that was in the late 90s. So that was still pretty cutting edge to put stuff on, on the internet at, uh, like that at that point. And uh, so he uh, showed me it and I was just like, oh, awesome. It's sort of like, you know, Grand Theft Auto, but like he was actually running it on like a NES emulator. So, and that's sort of where, you know, things grew out of for Retro City Rampage was sort of that combination. And the original name, well, one of the original names for uh, Retro City Rampage was uh, Retro Theftendo. So that was one. And then, what was there? Another, there's another one as well, but I forgot that one. So anyways, Brian, great programmer. And then he also did the art. And then he also did all the marketing. And one of the incredible things on the programming side is that it's probably almost in the Guinness Book of World Records, or at least it's up there as far as like a game that's been released on an insane amount of platforms. I think it's been released, I'm gonna guess and say 12 or something like that, but basically, uh, yeah, he's done an amazing job there. And the way that he describes that is like, it's not really actually a difficulty with the programming, it's more so the technical requirements of actually getting it so that you can talk to Sony or Nintendo or <coughs> Microsoft. And uh, yeah, we had a problem with Microsoft, but not a big problem, it's smallish, you know. Um, yeah, anyways, um, so yeah, different different platforms, tricky. Um, so, as far as my involvement with Retro City Rampage, he came out and show, saw a show that I was performing in uh, with a friend of mine, and we were doing sort of chiptune stuff, and he listened to it, and he's like, yeah, that's exactly what I want to have in the game. So, yeah, that's where that started. And then basically like four, almost five years later, the game got released. So the cool thing about working on Retro City Rampage is that I had a lot of time to sort of get up to speed. I actually didn't do chiptune much before then. So uh, it allowed me to, um, yeah, really get my you know, whatever ability up to where, like, at least it wasn't embarrassing to be next to like Vert, like Jake Kaufman, and then also um, Matt Creamer, who's, uh, you know, those were the two other guys on the album. But I was doing audio direction and I did all the sound effects for Retro City Rampage. And I also did all the marketing for the music. I also uh, was the publisher for the uh, vinyl as well. So I fronted the, the bill of the vinyl and made sure that that happened. And uh, the interesting thing about that is because we were having issues with uh, a publisher that uh, the music actually the soundtrack came out before the game and it's cool that uh, Brian allowed that to happen because uh, <clears throat> you know there's a possibility of like oh if people buy the vinyl because the vinyl was not cheap we put it at almost forty dollars because we we're basically putting it into like a collector's category and we only uh, sold we only did a run of 500 so um, yeah, that was that was her idea there. But the cool thing was is that it basically spun into extra marketing for the the game, which got released a little bit after that. But yeah, the the vinyl basically it's one of the only chiptune vinyls, and I'm pretty sure it's the only Canadian chiptune vinyl uh, that's out there at the moment, anyways. And uh, yeah, it, it it sold out within two months. So there's definitely a lot of you know, a lot of interest for people out there with uh, chiptune crossed with vinyl, you know, video game. Yeah, it was awesome. It was really an awesome experience to work on Retro City Rampage. So, tell us what chiptune is. Yeah, so chiptune is really producing modern music using old video game hardware. To me, that's sort of as simple as it gets. Um, it's one way of seeing it is that those old um, audio chips that they used to specifically put into systems, um, say like um, like the original arcade system for um, <clears throat> for Space Invaders, actually had a separate chip for each sound effect. 
So for the missile sound, there was a special chip that, you know, the guy that produced it, he actually had to manufacture that chip and make that so that the sounds could actually play at the same time. So back in the days, like making sound for arcade games was really expensive because each one of those chips would cost another thing to put on the board, you know, it increases the cost of the unit. So that's why a lot of those old arcade games have really crappy sound because it was really expensive. So yeah, chiptune is basically that. It's, uh, it's sort of somewhat separate from, you know, video game, sort of the original video game music because that is simply, to me, video game music where it's like you only had the system of like, you know, a Nintendo or a Commodore 64 or a Super Nintendo and you had to make music on it. So to me, that sort of uh, line is where people are making more modern music. So that's chiptune versus sort of like the original sort of uh, VGM, like video game kind of music side of things. Yeah, but some people don't draw that distinction. They just go like, oh, it's chiptune because it was made on an old system, which I think that's fine too. Yeah, so Vessel is uh, two-dimensional, but you know it's sort of rendered in 3D, but it's sort of a puzzle platformer uh, with liquid physics. So the idea being is that it's, uh, it's an alternate universe. A lot of people say steampunk, but we tried to avoid that, but it is kind of steampunky. And so that alternate universe, instead of using uh, electricity as sort of their main way of innovating their technology, they went in the direction of using water. And so what they were able to create is uh, life forms that are like robots, but made out of water. So the way that you solve different puzzles is figuring out how to get these water robots to do what you want them to do. So the tricky part with the audio for Vessel, I was the audio director for it, is to figure out how to make water, the sound of water, really come alive and to really represent the sound of these creatures. Um, and so for the sound of Vessel, I recorded everything myself. There's no library sound in there and it's all just recorded using the H4, so I had to work well with that. So, you know, we're talking earlier, it's, it's very, uh, you shouldn't let your tools limit you. And so for me, I found that that was a great way to get exactly the sounds that I wanted into the game. So I recorded tons of different audio samples from like waterfalls, like in Colombia when I was down there, uh, to my toilet, <laughs> um, and all sorts of stuff like out. Um, I recorded a lot at, uh, out in the country as well. I really like recording outside. And so I got a lot of really natural sounds. And so to create the environments, I really felt like it, uh, it, to me, it really comes alive, but in a good way, because I find that that game, it's, it's original enough that it strikes this, this balance of like where you're solving the puzzles, but the world itself is actually, for me, really evocative. So you can kind of just hang out in places. Uh, the other thing that was really neat for me about working with Vessel is that we worked with a pretty big name composer, John Hopkins, uh, and he supplied us uh, 10 songs 
Uh, it took me half a year to license them, but we eventually got them. And he gave us all the stems for that, so a large part of that game is figuring out how to get the stems from his music that were composed, you know, for a CD, how to pull those apart and make it so that as you're solving the puzzles, the music evolves with that as well. But it's not just Mickey Mousing, it's just like, oh, I fit these pieces together, clunk, in comes the beat. The beat will actually wait, and then it comes in at a musically, like, you know, relevant point. So if you're, uh, and also it will, the music will also sort of scale back a bit as well. If there's, if you're taking a long time, like if you're almost solved it, then the music is like, you know, it's almost all of, like together. And then, you can't quite how to figure figure out some stuff, then it'll actually take the layers away, not to make you totally feel bad, but it, it sort of gives you this idea that the music is sort of naturally underscoring. So there's some pretty complicated uh, systems that we use, and the system to do that was actually, um, like I designed it, but then uh, Kieran, a uh, programmer uh, was, uh, that was working on the audio, Kieran was the guy that really made it happen, and so we used a custom uh, adaptive music engine for that. And I have a video on, on YouTube that explains the whole thing, but uh, working with Vessel was uh, a really amazing experience to uh, just really, for me, push the boundaries of what I felt uh, I had done previously with adaptive uh, music especially. And then all, there was a whole bunch of stuff where we used uh, FMOD Designer to create some really interesting sort of dynamic soundscapes. And so I talked to the GDC about that, about the details of that. Uh, since 2001, I've been uh, teaching video game audio off and on, and when I got started uh, with that, I just made it so that I was a lot more interested in sort of spreading the knowledge that I had, because I realized being an audio programmer, and then also doing sound effects and composing, and also being somewhat of a people person, that I was able to sort of convey that knowledge to other people. So in 2003, that was my first presentation at the Game Developer Conference. With that talk, I was really focused on the how the aesthetic of the art that you're trying to produce through the technical requirements, where those two cross, and where those roles cross for people. Because if you look back uh, to the history of game audio, and probably you know a lot of the people that are you know on the film. There, they had to be very technical, and so there was this interesting combination of being an artist yet sort of filtering that through like a technical screen, like shoving it, you know. It's just like, I need to get this music happening! How do I, you know, how do I cram it into like this MML language where you have to like create a script and like loop like bars of music, and how do I like think about that so that I can produce something that actually sounds cool at the end of the day. Most of the times it didn't because people were just fighting the system or they were people that weren't artists. They were just programmers and they're like, oh, I need to make some sounds. And then they'd program some stuff and it's just like, oh, great, you know, Firebird Suite or like, you know, whatever, like the, I don't know, like uh, Modest Mussorgsky, like, you know, the, I don't know, or like Flight of the Valkyries or like all that kind of stuff that you know how it is. It's just like the things that get reused from like classical music where they're like, okay, there's the notes and then you just type in the notes through your audio engine and stuff. So that happened a lot at the beginning. So, with the School of Video Game Audio, uh, you know, I did my talk at GDC in 2003 and I just found that I had a lot of response to that. But um, the main thing was that people were just like, oh, where can I learn what you do? Like, I'm super stoked about learning more about game audio. And I was just like, well, there isn't really a place. Um, I mean, there's definitely like universities where you can learn a little bit about it, but if you just want to learn game audio, there just wasn't really a good place to do that. Um, when I was working at the Vancouver Film School, I was there for five years, and that's a great program, but the thing is that it's quite expensive, plus you have to be there in person, so that doesn't really fit in for a lot of people. Um, and then when I got into talking more and then traveling a bit more, either going to London or going to Portugal or going down to Brazil, I found that the super cool part about uh, talking about game audio for me was the possibility of people from different backgrounds, different cultures, different societies starting up their own video game culture. Like, what are Brazilian games going to be like? You know, they're a totally different language. Like, they have kind of like their own language on the planet, but they're like a huge market. And so when talking down in Brazil, I was just like, this, this is 
amazing. Like, but I, like being back in Vancouver, I can't really help them like people out like what I would do is that I would do talks and then I'd record them and I put them online and I thought that was fine but then I when teaching in person I really felt like uh, mentorship is the way to go like so that's what I do with the school is that it really is uh, a small amount of students they ask questions I give responses and then basically I just answer every question that they have either about you know from music to sound design mostly implementation uh, or even all the way down to programming for some of them. So the idea behind the school is really to sort of somewhat, you know, the big vision is to like democratize the information that we sort of have in the places where video games kind of got started. So I feel like uh, giving those people more tools and more information on how you know, good or even great, you know, like sound is technically made and how you get that done really allows for the, like the possibility of just games that are from different, like, you know, societies that we've never heard of or like heard of before, like making games. To me, that's like, yeah, that's it's very exciting. So that's the reason why I created the school is that I really want to help people out make games that we've never heard of before and that that really reflect their own cultures. Because I think to me, yeah, I'm super stoked on that because it's just it's like it's something really new. Like I want to I love doing stuff that's new and <clears throat> gaming has been really good for that. But uh, yeah, education is, is even better because then you just sort of hand it off to people that are going to do their own awesome things. Uh, yes, that's right. Yes, the beep, the beep documentary. So yes, I've had uh, you know the good good luck to be able to, and it's almost be a year, hey. Oh man. So yes, I uh, was asked to do uh, composing for the beep documentary, and I had a great time doing the Kickstarter, getting some money together, burn through all that money. <coughs> Sushi. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, anyways, I had some good times along the way, and uh, yeah, I'm very much looking forward to doing more composing for the Beep soundtrack. My idea is to really fuse uh, electronic, sort of chiptune-y kind of stuff, or sort of classic video game kind of sound, uh, with a bit of uh, string sort of stuff, so I'm hoping to work with the cellist and probably use some sampled sound as well to really sort of uh, build a very emotive and I hope evocative uh, sort of, you know, background to the, uh, the interviews for the film and to create a shape for the whole film itself as well to really take you on an adventure because, uh, man, it's going to be a crazy trip. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sushi. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's good. That's going in the, uh... <laughs> yeah.